and we're up for the archive video. Um, all right, so um, welcome to the Denver Rust meetup, regardless of wherever you are in the world. Uh, these days, it doesn't matter that we're, you know, we can't even have it in person if we wanted to. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, and uh, uh, this is the second meetup that we've had since, I guess, like we restarted it after, you know, COVID hit. Um, and we have a speaker for next month. Um, and then after that, we'll probably take a break for Christmas time. And then um, uh, if anybody wants to talk, uh, it sounds like Ahmed, we might, uh, you might be able to give a talk. Um, but if anybody wants to give a talk, please let me know. I'd be happy to schedule in for next year. And uh, I don't necessarily want any specific times uh, that we're gonna do like every time at 6.30 on Thursdays or so. I figured that we can just do this whenever, so that way we can hit, you know, we have plenty of people in plenty of different time zones that can can come and uh, uh, join us. Um, and I'm I'm going to eventually lose my um, my Zoom uh, uh, Pro account, so I'm going to have to purchase one. So I I would love to find a sponsor that would help me out with that purchase. So if any of you know any uh, any companies that would be happy to do that, um, I would be happy to do whatever advertisements they would want um, uh, in, that, in that exchange. Uh, so if you know that person, uh, reach out to me and I would be happy to talk to them. You know that person, talk to me. Oh yeah, I'll be happy to, yeah. Let's talk about that offline. I'm happy yeah, to uh, set that up. Yeah, I, um, I sent you a private message for uh, uh, the talk anyway, so we can also talk about that at the same time. Sounds great, take care. Um, all right. Well, with that, um, I don't want to take any more time up. So, Andy, um, are you uh, are you ready? I'm ready to go. Yeah, let me uh, share my screen here. All right. I guess I should have tested that earlier. But... Okay, hopefully, um, I think I'm sharing my full screen. Hopefully, everybody can see a slide. I can see it. Oh, awesome. Oops. So yeah, so this talk is going to be about Rust for Data Science and specifically about three projects that I've been pretty involved in. Um, so Apache Arrow, Data Fusion, and Ballista. And all of these projects are related, as we see. And as we go through this, feel free to interrupt and ask questions as we go. So just a little bit of background about me. So I've been in software like forever, 30 years and somehow I've ended up in JVM land for most of the last 20 years. And I think that's one thing that led me to start getting really excited about Rust. Um, I worked with C++ before getting into Java and I kind of felt the need to get back into some system level programming. And over the past decade, I've mostly been working with distributed systems and query engines. So I figured, like a great way to really learn Rust beyond the basics would be to try and build something. So I took on an overly ambitious project. I tried to build something like Apache Spark in Rust. Um, there's a blog post here, which I can share um, in the chat later on. Uh, but I started this project about two years ago, two and well, actually nearly three years ago now, I guess. Um, and that's kind of what led to these various projects. So let's start with Apache Arrow. Um, so Arrow is a cross-language development platform for in-memory analytics. And Arrow is um, two things really. Um, it's a specification and there are a bunch of libraries in different languages that implement the specification. So the core of the specification is what's normally referred to just as the Arrow format. And this is basically a memory layout for columnar data. Um, so it covers primitive types, you know, like fixed width types, like in 32 and 64. Um, it covers variable length types like strings or binary. And it also handles nested types mm -hmm. like lists, maps, and structs, and so on. Um, but all of the memory layouts have some commonality. The, the raw values are stored in contiguous buffers. Um, for variable length types, there are separate buffers containing offsets. So if you want to find the start of the string, uh, you know, um, index five within the array, if you look up index five in the offset buffer, that will give you the actual point where the, the, the value starts in the, yeah. the value 
I am so sorry to interrupt. I sure. think I might not be the only one seeing just your editor view and not the slides if you're moving through. Oh, thanks for, uh, okay. Let me see, try that again. Here we go. Multi-monitor. Yes, that's, that's it. Great, thanks for that. Yeah, I think I shared, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I shared the browser rather than the screen. Um, so yeah, you may not have been seeing this slide. So it's just really talking through um, this first section about the formats, explaining that all of these arrays are backed by buffers uh, containing data and offsets. And then um, there's a separate validity, uh, validity bitmap. So no, the representation of null values isn't stored in the buffers themselves, but in a separate bitmap. And that makes it very efficient. Um, to vectorize operations. So let's say you have two arrays of integers and some of them may be null. Um, you know, naively, if you were coding this yourself with regular arrays, you'd have a for loop. And then you'd say, well, if, if um, you know, array one is null or not null, and if array two is not null, then add them together. Um, and those kind of branches in the loop make it hard for the compiler to vectorize operations. So it's much more efficient just to add all of the numbers together, even though some may not be valid, and then apply uh, the bitmap afterwards to get the, to the, the kind of final values. So this whole thing is really optimized to take advantage of vectorized processing. And for most people, that means either using SIMD on the CPU, that same instruction, multiple data, or um, it's really well you know, optimized for GPU as well. So that's the core memory format. Um, and again, this is designed so that you can, uh, you can do this in any language and you can pass this data between languages without the overhead of serialization um, because the memory format is the serialization format. Mm -hmm. now, now, when you are passing data between different languages, um, you, also, you do have to deal with the metadata as well. So Arrow defines this IPC format, uh, inter-process communication, and that's really, it's really about describing the metadata. So describing the schema, the fields, the data types, um, and that uses flat buffers, uh, which is a, a serialization format that's well supported in different languages. And then finally, and this is uh, quite a recent development, Apache Arrow now has this flight protocol, which is gRPC based. So it's um, specified in protocol buffer format. And this is a protocol for distributed systems dealing with Arrow data. So it has the concept of sending queries and fetching results or sending data, so uploading or downloading. And it's designed so that you can do this um, like in parallel across servers. So unlike something like, I mean, traditional database systems with JDBC and ODBC drivers, you tend to have a single connection to one server. Mm -hmm. And even with distributed systems, this is a common pattern. So even though you have the power of a cluster to process your queries, often you're down to a single channel to fetch the data back and everything's being funneled through a single server. So the flight protocol is designed to kind of break out of that pattern and have kind of more of a distributed and parallel, uh, I guess, interaction style from a client. So that's the specification. And then um, the libraries themselves. So I think there's like 11 libraries now. Um, C++ and Java are the most mature. And then the Python and R libraries leverage the C++ libraries. So, you know, it's pretty mature as well. Um, Rust, obviously, is the one we'll be talking about tonight. And there's a, there's a PR just went up this week, I think, for a Julia implementation. So beyond the, um, so with all of these libraries, they have the representation of these memory formats for the different array types. But some of the implementations go further and provide these computational kernels. So you have these arrays of data, you typically want to perform some operations on them, whether it's arithmetic or filtering, um, performing aggregates. So C++, Java, and Rust are the, at least the three libraries that I know about which provide those kind of kernels. And finally, the next level up, uh, like query engines. Rust is the first Arrow implementation to have a, a query engine, but there is one being developed in the C++ library right now. Um, so that's pretty, that's pretty cool, and that will be used. Um, the great thing about the C++ one is that it will be exposed to Python and R. Um, so people using Python and R get exactly the same semantics of the underlying computations. So moving on to the Rust implementation. Um, so these are so, so these are really the core concepts in the Rust Arrow uh, 
that crate. And within the Apache Arrow project, there are multiple crates. So there's the core Arrow crate, um, which we talk about now. Um, so there are representations of uh, the metadata, so schemas, fields, data types. And then there are arrays for the different data types. So uh, the primitive array type is for fixed width types, like um, you know integers and booleans and so on. And then there are, actually, I guess I missed some out here, but for variable length types like string and binary specific array types. And for um, the things like structs and dictionary arrays, it's quite a, um, it's getting fairly comprehensive at this point. And typically, if you use a builder to create an array in the first place and populate it with data, although there are convenience methods provided to for converting from things like VEC or VEC of option of some type, um, which we'll see there'll be some code samples coming up. Um, so the Rust implementation has a bunch of compute kernels, so you can actually do useful things with the data that you have. Um, there's a thing called a record batch. So if you're representing tabular data, which is very common, um, you can have you can represent batches of column the data with a known schema. And then finally, we have some IO. So for CSV, JSON, and Parquet, uh, readers are provided where you can read directly into Arrow structures, into Arrow arrays, rather than having to read into one format and then convert into Arrow. And in some cases, writers are available. Um, so the CSV, we have read and write. I think JSON's read only. And Parquet is uh, read-only in the uh, 2.0 release. There's a lot of work ongoing to get the writer in place. Um, so hopefully that will be available for the next release. Okay, so onto some code samples. Um, so this is a very kind of simple example of building an array of a primitive value. So in this case, we are using a, uh, we're building an array of int 32s. So we create a builder with a fixed size. Just say they're gonna be five elements. And then we can start appending values or appending nulls. So the important thing here is that the so these values are going into this fixed fixed width buffer, contiguous piece of memory. Um, and when we append null values, we're just skipping over an element, um, but we're writing to the bitmap to say that um, those elements are null. So whatever values are in there just get ignored, basically. And then when we call a finish method, it gives us an immutable array from those values. Um, and here's an example of using one of the compute kernels. So this is just, uh, I copied this from one of the unit tests. And in this case, we're creating two arrays using uh, the from method. So we're just converting vec vectors to arrays just as a convenience. It's not the most performant thing to do. So we have a, an array of int 32s. Um, then we have a Boolean array and here we're demonstrating we can call this filter kernel and pass in references to these two arrays. Uh, so basically it's using the Boolean values as predicates to filter the int 32s. So in that Boolean vector, we have uh, two true values. So after running this, we the, the result is uh, an int32 array with two values. And you'll see here uh, the use of downcast. So there's one trait for array um, but obviously there are many types of arrays. So this is a very common pattern in Arrow, um, where you typically rely on the metadata, the schema information about the data set you're working with. Um, so you can introspect the schema to know that you're dealing with an int32, for example, and then you can downcast the array to an int a specific type like int32. And then you can call methods like value or is valid um, to check for each element what the, what the value is or whether it's a null or not. So I mentioned record batches and schemas. So record batch is a very simple struct. It's basically just a VEC of arrays, um, but it has this schema reference as well. And the schema is essentially a vector of fields and each field has a name, a data type, and whether it allows null values or not. Um, it also has some metadata. So if you're dealing with things like dictionary encoded arrays, there'll be some extra metadata around that as well. Okay, so that's kind of a quick overview of the arrow crate. Um, so does anybody have any questions so far? And I can't see the chat, so you have to um, speak up if you have any questions. Okay, sounds like we're good to move on. So I mentioned there are multiple crates in the Arrow projects, in the Rust sub project. So the Arrow is the core crate with the, these data structures. 
And then the next crate we're going to talk about is Data Fusion. So Data Fusion builds on top of this core arrow crate to provide a query engine uh, supporting SQL and data frame APIs. And so yeah, it leverages the arrow compute kernels. Um, you can run queries currently against CSV, Parquet, and in-memory data. Um, there are APIs where you can plug in your own data sources as well. Um, and in the, the recent release of Arrow this week, um, Data Fusion now uses async, um, which is a pretty huge step forward. Um, we're using the Tokyo threaded runtime to actually do the query execution. And it supports partitions. So let's say you, you're working with a Parquet data source. Typically, Parquet, you have a directory containing multiple files. Um, so Data Fusion will process those files as separate partitions in parallel using Tokyo. Um, this is kind of an overview of the architecture of the query execution. Um, so the data frame is really the main API for building a logical query plan. And a logical query plan is just really a description of what you want to do rather than how it's going to be executed. So it's a, like a tree-like structure containing things like, um, there's an op containing operators. So at the bottom of a query plan, typically you have an operator like a, a parquet, parquet scan where it's reading the parquet file. And you have other operators like filter or projection or aggregate. Um, so yeah, the data frame API is typically how you build your query plan. Um, if you're using SQL, the SQL um, code is, is also using the data frame API to build the query. So it doesn't matter whether you're using SQL or data frame, you get the same query plan. Um, and, once you, and when you build a data frame, um, even if you're building one manually, you can then run SQL against that data frame as well. So you can kind of mix and match those two approaches. Um, so Data Fusion has an optimizer. It only has some fairly um, kind of basic optimization rules so far, and you can plug in your own. So it has things like predicate push down, where it will, if you have a where clause in your query, or basically try and push it down um, as far into that query plan as it can. So it filters out rows as early as possible to get the best performance. Um, it would also do things like add implicit casts between data types where that's supported. Um, so after the query optimizer is run, we end up with this optimized logical plan. And then the next step is to translate that into the physical plan, which is where we're really dealing with things like partitions um, and use of the Tokyo thread pool and kind of sort order and those kind of things. Um, so for example, if you're, if you have, let's say we're doing like an aggregate query, like a select group by with a sum and accounts, um, the logical plan is very simple for that. There's a single operator for the aggregate. But once we get into the physical planning, what we really want to do is parallelize as much as possible. So the way a hash aggregate would be executed, um, an aggregate query would be run against each partition in parallel. And then the results of those aggregates would be combined down to a single partition and then a secondary aggregate gets applied to get to the final result. Um, the physical plan is pluggable as well. Um, so people can use this. In fact, some, some people are starting to use Data Fusion now, um, but with their own backends. So they can use, they can take advantage of the UX all the way through from SQL through to the optimized logical plan. And then they can provide their own physical planner if they want to do something completely different with query execution, like running a distributed query, for example. So data fusion is purely in memory, single process. So, um, so far the data frame supports these operations. So it's not as comprehensive as we need to do um, a lot of kind of real world things. The thing that's really missing right now or the next thing uh, are joins um, and there is work starting on implementing joins for a future release, but it can do a good job of, you know, aggregates and filters and so on. Okay, so here's a code example. Um, this is a yeah, pretty sim simple example, but this is using the data frame API. So we start off here by creating an execution context, and then we can start calling methods to build up our query plan. So the first thing we do here is recording a read parquet method and passing a path to a parquet file or directory. Um, so each of these methods is returning a data frame. At any point, we could go and execute that. But as we're recording these methods, we're really just building up the the representation of the query that we eventually want to run. So we read, the, we, after calling the read parquet, um, so we can then call select columns. This is a simple projection based on column names. So again, that returns a modified data frame. 
and then it's calling a filter. So we're going to filter our based on filter rows based on the ID column. So we're going to filter so we just get rows where the ID is greater than literal value one. So again, nothing's actually happened at this point. We're just describing what we want to happen. And then the here we're executing and we want to collect all the results back to this um, into memory, basically. So the collect method, um, which is an async method, this is where it will go through this whole process of translating the um, logical plan into the optimized plan and the physical plan, and then, then actually take care of the execution. Um, so here's another example. This is the SQL API. So in this case, so when you have SQL, you know, you're, you're running queries against tables. Um, so you have to, we need to, to kind of register those tables. So in this case, we, on the context, we call a method register parquet, and there's one for CSV as well. Um, we provided a table name and then the path to where the data lives. And with that done, we can go ahead and run just regular SQL. And, and again, the, so the SQL method returns a data frame. So again, we just call collect if we want to just run the query and get the results. There are other methods. Um, so rather than collect, you could say, you know, save as CSV file. And in the future, you'll be able to save to Parquet in other formats. Um, so onto performance. Um, so this is an unfair benchmark and I'll explain why in the next slide. Um, so what I did here, I compared, I took, so TPCH, um, TPC, the Transaction Processing Council, they produce a lot of um, kind of industry standard benchmarks that uh, supposedly represent kind of real world usage of databases and analytics platforms. Um, so I chose that, I chose TPCH um, and a lot of the queries in this benchmark suite require joins. Query one is one of the queries that doesn't require joins. So that's why I chose this one. And this is running an aggregate query with quite a number of aggregates. And one of the nice things about the TPC benchmarks is that you, they provide a data generator and you can choose to generate data at different scales. Um, so it's a great way for testing scalability. In this case, it's a small data set, just 100 gigabytes. Um, so I tested running this query, uh, 100 gigabyte aggregate query with Data Fusion and Apache Spark, the current GA release, uh, with a varying number of threads. And what this shows is the, the query time uh, sparks a bit faster on a small number of threads. Data Fusion is about 30 to 40% faster with a higher number of threads, which is cool. Um, but I think my takeaway from this is they're kind of roughly equivalent. Um, so that's kind of a good sign because for in previous releases, Data Fusion wasn't really um, competitive um, with other platforms out there, as you would expect, being a fairly new project. Um, but it's reached a level of maturity now where, um, yeah, it's much closer comparison. So on to why this is an unfair benchmark, and it's unfair in kind of both directions. So Apache Spark is a distributed system. Um, it's designed to scale on clusters of hundreds or thousands of servers, and Data Fusion isn't. Data Fusion is just using a thread pool. Um, so it hasn't, you know, it's a simpler design. It doesn't have the same overheads. And also Apache Spark is really optimized for big data, and 100 gigs isn't really big data. So Apache Spark will go through some effort uh, up front before it even starts running the query. It will do code generation um, so to take advantage of the JIT compiler uh, in Java. So on the small data set, that overhead can have some impact. And Spark would probably do better on um, you know, much larger data sets. But conversely, uh, data fusion scales down much better. So I typically, typically see uh, that Spark needs five to 10 times more memory than data fusion, um, which is pretty significant. So for some cases, like if you are dealing with smaller data sets in the you know, below terabyte range, it may well be advantageous to use something like data fusion. Okay, so that's the end of um, the data fusion, data fusion part. Are there any, any questions on that part? So you mentioned you're doing um, a lot of work in ETL, is that right? Yeah, I mean, that's been really been the main use case I've been following. Um, that's what's kind of fueled my interest in this. So yeah, SQL and data frame type operations. Um, yeah, doing those kind of transformations. So um, Spark being a distributed system, I know that it's being used a lot for ETL and mm -hmm. 
typically being done in the cloud where you're paying a high cost for the memory that you're using. Right. Um, is that probably the wrong architecture for companies that are doing ETL and something like this could be super beneficial for them by so, just spawning a new process every time a new file comes in, if it's small data? Yeah, so it really depends how big your data is. I mean, if, you, if your data fits on one computer, you shouldn't be using Spark, in my opinion. Um, Spark, I mean, the real benefit of Spark is when you, you know, you, it's just not feasible to do it on one computer. Um, and you can do a lot on one computer. I mean, if like, some of the computers, like in my day job, um, been, I'm using like computers with hundreds of cores and, you know, very powerful systems, terabyte of RAM. Um, so you can, you can kind of do a lot. Um, but I think one, one of the things that, that's promising about data fusion and Ballista, which we're going to come on to, is that, you know, because it is five to 10 times less memory intensive, you can do so much more on a single node. Um, and once you go to multiple nodes, you have inherent overheads, you know, regardless of how good your technology is, you have all this overhead of the data being sent over the network and shuffled around. Um, so the more you can do on a single node, um, the better really. Um, so like today with Spark, maybe you need five nodes because you can't fit it in memory, but with uh, data fusion, you can just, if you can fit it on a single node, it's going to go a lot faster than Spark on five nodes. At least that's the theory. And is a lot of the memory overhead in comparison just due to garbage collection or is there other things going on? So I don't have a definitive answer to that. I mean, I think garbage collection is, I mean, that's definitely a big factor. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have a definitive answer, I guess. Um, so I'm not, I mean, I, I know Spark pretty well at this point, but I'm not like a total expert in it. Um, you know, it's designed to do everything in memory as is data fusion and Java's use of, you know, Java, there's a lot of object creation going on. And so I, I was, I mean, I, my, my gut feel is it's mostly the object creation and garbage collection that really, um, really has the biggest impact there. All right, thank you. Sure. So, uh, Carlos yeah, go has ahead. a question, which is, uh, is this wonderful Arrow project ready for production? Arrow is already used in production generally. Um, so, but maybe not specifically the Rust implementation of Arrow. Um, I don't, to my knowledge, nobody's using the Rust implementation of Arrow in production so far. Um, I do feel it's on, I, I do feel it is production ready, the, the, at least the, the core Arrow crate. Maybe data fusion, not quite yet. Um, but it, it really much, very much depends on your use case. And would you also say it depends on the specific language implementation? I've noticed like on the C sharp side, there's very much that's marked as not implemented yet. Very much so. I mean, that's one of the things that's kind of interesting that it's one project and one repo and the release is a, like the two zero releases for all of the sub projects. Um, but all of the projects are at different stages of evolution. Um, so yeah, it very much does depend on the language as well. One thing that's kind of significant with Arrow, so the, the project, I think it's about five years old, um, but the actual, the format, the specification that got to a 1.0 release uh, a few months ago. So we have this kind of commitment now that the specification, um, you know, any changes now will be backwards compatible. That's obviously kind of a big deal. Um, and it's also kind of confusing because now we've just had the Arrow 2.0 release. Um, but it's still using the 1.0 version of the, the, the format or the specification. Okay, so, so now we move on to Ballista, which is kind of the last part of this. Um, so Ballista isn't, so, so one thing I need to be clear on, so Apache Arrow um, and Data Fusion are both part of the Apache Arrow project. Um, Ballista isn't. Ballista is just kind of I guess my project. Um, and this is really back to where I started. This is me continuing with my um, kind of overly ambitious goal of trying to build something like Spark in Rust. Um, but as I go through this journey, I kind of try things out in Ballista and the things that I find that work out well, um, you know, most of the time that gets contributed back to Data Fusion or Arrow. So this is kind of my use case for driving, um, driving the, um, you know, driving the roadmap in Arrow, if you like. Um, I mean, obviously other people are doing the same thing with their projects as well, which is great. So um, yeah, so what is Ballista? So Ballista, I guess I'm, I'm calling it a research project because it's mostly been me hacking away on it kind of weekends and evenings. Um, and the goal is to build something like Apache Spark based on Apache Arrow. 
And so in some ways it's quite similar to Spark. Um, so I, I kind of like the way that Spark does its scheduling. Um, so Spark takes a query, um, it takes the query plan and it breaks it into stages based on the partitioning. So within one query stage, you may have multiple operators um, with the same partitioning. So maybe there's a projection and a filter and a, a sort. And if the partitioning is the same, it means that you can execute all of those partitions in parallel. So one stage, you can just go, you break it down into these tasks or partitions and send those out to a cluster to be computed. And then when, when that stage is finished, you can then schedule the next stage that depends on the output of that stage. Um, so Ballista uses it, the exact same model for that. Um, but the way that it's different to Spark, I mean, Spark is like an amazing platform. Um, the Scala uh, and JVM in general just really, I feel, wasn't the best choice because of the memory. Um, but I mean, for many reasons, but especially the garbage collection when you're dealing with terabytes or petabytes of data, um, you know, garbage collection can become really problematic. So, um, and that's really what, you know, why I thought Rust was a great choice. Um, but I've made some other decisions as well. Um, so I wanted it to be very kind of language neutral because one of the issues with Spark is that you kind of, I mean, everybody has, everybody has to learn Scala just to use Spark and you want to write UDFs, you pretty much have to do them in Scala. I mean, you can do things like Python, but there are some overheads involved there, um, which there wouldn't have been if the whole thing had been kind of built in arrow from day one. Um, but it's very hard to kind of retrofit standards like these. So with Ballista, so I made, I made some choices. Um, so I chose uh, the Arrow Flight Protocol um, for all of the interaction between um, like the executors in the cluster, because um, that's well supported by different languages. And then the query plans themselves, I defined a protocol buffer format for describing a physical query plan um, and, and logical query plans so that those can be exchanged between languages as well. There's no reason for those to be tied to Rust or Java. Um, so that means you can build executors in different languages. And within the context of one query being executed, uh, it could involve custom code. Like you maybe you've got some legacy Java stuff you need to call. Maybe you've got some new really cool Rust stuff. You know, there should be no reason why you can't mix and match those in the same query plan. So here's kind of a diagram to show um, the architecture. So yeah, Ballista is designed to be run as a distributed cluster with executors. Um, so I targeted Kubernetes as the main deployment platform. And um, for local testing, I use Docker Compose as well. Um, but everything's containerized. So an executor is a container implementing the flight protocol. Um, and from that point, you don't really care what the implementation is. And um, within the Ballista project, there are actually, I kind of missed one on the slides. There are actually three executors today. There's a Rust executor, a Java executor that's actually implemented in Kotlin. Um, but there's also a Spark executor. So the Spark executor can take a Ballista query plan, translate it to an Apache Spark query plan and execute it. So, um, so already it has compatibility with Spark and conversely, it'd be possible to call Ballista from existing Spark jobs. So one thing I was really keen on doing, um, it'll be a long time before Ballista obviously is as uh, comprehensive as something like Apache Spark, which has thousands of contributors and has been around for many years. So I, I thought a great way to uh, make it easier for people to try as if people could take like one piece of their pipeline and experiment with moving that to Rust and running it in Ballista and have it work with their um, existing Spark cluster. So um, the current state of Ballista, so there's a 030 release uh, a few months ago and it's based on the previous version of Data Fusion and Arrow. Um, as I said, it supports Kubernetes. Um, from a client, you can use a data frame API or a SQL API to build your query, and then you submit that to the cluster for execution. And it has roughly the same support as data fusion in terms of the different operators and expressions. And the performance isn't fantastic yet. I would say I've got it to a point where it's kind of okay performance. Um, but as now that um, there have been a lot of optimizations in Apache Arrow 2, so I'm hoping that when I, uh, one of the next steps is to upgrade Ballista to use this new Arrow release. And I'm hoping that we'll see some, uh, like a good boost in performance. But there's also more work to do on the scheduler in Ballista. It's currently pretty naive and that's really one of the main areas um, that I'm gonna be looking to improve. And with that, I have a, a quick demo, um, which I conveniently have open somewhere. 
Okay. So this is just a kind of command line based demo, and I don't know um, if many of you are familiar with Kubernetes. Let me just hit play on this. So but what we're doing here is we're um, running some commands to make sure there are no pods running in our Kubernetes cluster. And now I'm applying a YAML description, which is basically saying to run a number of executors based on some ballista Docker containers or Docker images. So here we're spinning up, I think it's 12, I think I'm spinning up 12 executors here. And these are the Rust executors implementing the flight protocol. And then, okay, I guess it's only six. And then with that running, um, let me just pause this for a moment, actually. So we're running um, a client, for an example, which is running the TPCH query from SQL. And this debug output here is showing the query plan um, that the SQL has been translated into. So at the bottom here, we have a parquet scan of the path to where the data is. And it assumes that there's a shared file system that all the executors have access to the same data. Um, so after the parquet scan, the next operator is a selection or a filter where we're filtering rows based on a, a date. And then there's the aggregate query itself. So we're grouping the data on a couple of fields. And then there's like a whole bunch of aggregates and some um, like some math expressions in there. So we just hit play again here. So this is now this is now running in parallel across these executors. And then the groups get um, kind of combined to one of the executors and combined the final aggregate happens and then the results get returned to the client. So this is a similar experience that you would have with something like Apache Spark, for example. Okay. Oops. Um, so that's kind of getting to the end. So yeah, I mentioned 0 0.4. So yeah, there's some upgrades to do. Um, when I started on, or not started, but when I worked on this previous Ballista release, um, I ended up copying and pasting a bunch of stuff from the Arrow project and Data Fusion because it didn't have the extension points that I needed. And that's been one of the big focuses for 2.0 was to get uh, extension points into that project so that I can remove much of the Ballista code and really make it um, really that you're using Data Fusion, but then Ballista provides the, the physical planner um, that takes care of the distributed execution. And so apart from that, joins is really the next big thing. Because um, without joins, it's really hard to do a lot of kind of real world problems. And joins are the reason why you need clusters. Without joins, you you, you know, there's a lot you can do in a single node. So that's pretty much it. I just wanted to do a shameless plug. Um, so I wrote a, a book a while ago, um, How Query Engines Work. It's uh, just an introduction. If you're interested in learning more about, you know, SQL parsers and query planners and optimization rules and all those kind of things. Um, yeah, check it out, it's on Lean Pub. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for listening. There's a few links there. Um, I'll share, I, I guess I can upload these slides. I'll figure out a way to share these slides um, so everybody can kind of take a look afterwards. But yeah, thanks, and are there any more questions? Oh, yay. Thank you so much. Uh, but one question. Um, the, if uh, if if one wanted to contribute code to to this uh, to kind of start looking at uh, how to how to start uh, contributing, uh, where what's a good place to kind of begin? It's a great question. So um, so for the Apache Arrow project um, and, and which and Data Fusion is part of that um, issues.apache.org. It's not the um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Jira, not the most exciting thing. Um, but there's, um, if you, in Jira, basically we do have um, a number of, this is where we do our issue tracking for Apache Arrow. And there, there's actually a blog post coming out um, this week about a release, which will have some links in there. Um, but in the meantime, if you go to the Apache Jira, choose the Arrow project and um, search for the Rust components. That would probably be it. That's kind of a great place to start. And we have been tagging some of the issues with labels, uh, ones that we think are kind of good. Yeah, we go. It's like a beginner label. Um, so yeah, there are a number of issues in here. That's pretty, that could be a pretty good place to get started. Um, I'd also recommend joining the Arrow mailing list. There's a dev mailing list. 
and that's a great place just to kind of introduce yourself and see you know what people are looking for help with at any any one time that's lovely thank you um also would you be so kind as to share the url for your book in the chat where it's clickable or or tweet or something yeah be very happy to do that We have a couple questions in the chat also. Uh, Carlos asked, what are the major difficulties um, or needs in the current state of the project? So that's a great question. So within the Arrow project itself, one of the big challenges we've been facing is that um, we've been using some nightly features. Um, specifically, we've been using the specialization feature um, in the um, Arrow and Parquet crates, which has forced us to stay on nightly. And that's really, uh, I think, limiting adoption of the project. Um, we did actually have a PR go in just after the 2.0 release that resolved it for the Arrow crates. But the Parquet crate still has that issue. And because Data Fusion depends on Parquet, Data Fusion also requires nightly. So that's definitely one thing. It is kind of a deeply technical thing um, that you know not everybody knows how to resolve. So that's one area where help, I think, would be very useful. Um, and another big area is the whole kind of async um, topic. So we just implemented async in parts of Arrow and Data Fusion, and that's it's working out really well. But the Parquet crate doesn't support async. Um, we do. There is a contributor working on that. Um, I'm sure they would be happy to have some help. Um, and we've had to. So the Parquet crate wasn't really designed with async in mind. And like I know in Data Fusion, we had to do some. Um, it, I mean, essentially, we had to kind of manage our own threads to do the interactions with Parquet and then use channels um, to go from async to interact with the things happening on that thread. Um, and it works, but it, it'll, be, it'll be really nice if we could make everything async end to end. And I think we would get better um, kind of scalability overall. And beyond that, um, like, so Data Fusion is coming along really well, but it has a limited set of operators and expressions. Um, which means um, it limits its kind of use in the real world. Um, so, you know, a, a great way to contribute is just to take data fusion and try running some queries against your own data and see kind of what things are not supported. You know, maybe there are additional cast operations or, um, you know, maybe different string manipulation functions that need to be built in. And those are kind of, those are quite an easy way to get involved because there is a framework for registering like user defined functions and user defined aggregate functions. So if there's just additional functionality at that level, I think that's a, a pretty good place to kind of get involved. Awesome. Um, another question is, have you considered including Tonic as an alternative to flight in the gRPC queries? So we actually use this Tonic. Um, so Tonic provides the, like the gRPC um, I'm not sure I even know how to explain this. Um, so, but, so flight, in fact, let me just like um, conveniently have the repo open here. So within flight, um, there's the, act, oh no, it's the generator. Okay, this is the generator's code. But the, so the flight protocol is defined in like a protobuf file. And from that, we generate Rust code for the different kind of operations you can do in flight. So, um, so flight has a concept of actions and results, uh, flight descriptors. Um, but this is so tonic doesn't do this, of course. Tonic is the like the server and the th you know the, the use of async to be able to, able to handle gRPC. So, in fact, I, I should just show the code um, for this. So, if you look at the, so we have an arrow flight crate. I think it's an example. Okay, here's an example server, I guess. So we provide an implementation for this generated code. And then, um, okay, this is a bad example, but this, this, is using, um, this is using Tonic, basically, to actually start the server. Sorry, that's not a great answer. Um, but yeah, Tonic, Tonic is definitely in, in, the, in there. Um, I think we have a better example somewhere. Yeah, so we see use of Tonic here for the server. And so, I mean, yeah, Tonic's really like the transport and flight is the protocol, the, the shape of the data going over that transport, if that makes sense. Yeah, awesome. 
Um, and that's all the questions I have in chat. I have uh, another question. You showed that in the architecture diagram that it's possible to connect um, BI tools through the GDBC driver. Um, does a Aeroflight support, um, you know, access and permission models? Um, I, I, so it's a good question. I, I maybe don't really know the answer to that. I think it maybe provides mechanisms where you could implement it, um, but I don't think there's anything kind of specifically for that in the protocol. Um, because there are there, there are kind of you know there's metadata and really kind of different actions you can have, but I don't think there's anything ex like explicitly in there for that, as far as I know. But I could be wrong. That maybe would be a good question to kind of post to the mailing list to, as a follow up. So as far as you know, Aeroflight is a uh, all or nothing, basically for access to the data. I think it's really down to um, like implementations. So um, when you send a query, like so queries, um, in fact, let me just go find the proto buff because I think that'll be kind of useful. So let's see if I can find that. Here we go, flight.proto. So it's a flight surface. Okay, so there's a handshake um, that you do when you, when you connect to a service, there is a concept of a handshake. So that's probably, there's something I haven't looked at, which is why I'm kind of a um, bit vague on the answer here. Okay, so one thing about flight is that a lot, there's certain parts, although it's a standard, there's certain parts of it where it's pretty opaque. So in the handshake, there's a payload, which is just binary. So it's down to the um, implementation, like as to what data is in there or what that means. So yes, like people implementing flight could choose to use this, um, you know, to pass credentials and do kind of authentication, those kind of things. And, okay, I guess there is a basic auth in here, use name password. So yeah, there is, I mean, so I think, you know, I'm not sure it goes as far as kind of access control, but you could probably do that yourself by how you interpret this, like what you put in these payloads. Um, yeah, if that's, yeah, I think that's about as helpful an answer as I can give, sorry. Okay, thanks. Sure. And uh, what communication channels do you use most for coordinating around the Ballista project specifically? So for Ballista, um, yeah, let me just do jump over there real quick. Uh, so Ballista, do, so actually there's um, Discord and Gitter. Um, they're not particularly active. Um, there are, I think, you know, the, uh, there are a number of issues in here as well. Um, so, but yeah, I'd, I'd say like the, uh, the, the Discord channel or uh, I guess so they're great places just to hold on, say hi, and kind of talk about, you know, ask questions and see whether a good places to contribute. Awesome. And you're working at NVIDIA, is that correct? That's correct. Um, is there any plans to adopt Rust for doing CUDA-like stuff on GPUs directly? Sadly, no. <laughs> um, so like... <laughs> You know, there are, there are people there, and I can't really talk about NVIDIA stuff too much, but I mean, there are people there that are very interested in Rust and, you know, definitely there, there are people there that would love to find ways of, you know, NVIDIA adopting Rust, but I'm not aware of anything like uh, officially happening there. Cool. All right, any last questions? All right, well, thank you so much, Andy, for uh, giving this talk. This was really great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for listening, that's great. Thank you uh, so much, this was so much fun. Um, so we we do have a speaker lined up for next month. Um, they are getting me the details and choosing what uh, daytime they're going to be given talk. So I'll get that information out on the meetup page uh, as soon as I have it, which hopefully should be in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, uh, but until until then, this is this is it. So until next time, uh, stay safe out there, everybody, and uh, happy resting. Thanks for hosting, Brooks. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And th thank you again for talking. This was a great talk. Thanks.
Thanks, guys. Hey, hey Brooke. Uh, Brooks, I didn't see your... I'm sorry, I, I don't know why I called you Brooke. Um, uh, <laughs> would you... Uh, I don't know. Uh, I didn't see your private message. Did you send it to me on Twitter? Or did you send it to me here? 